I'm going to be talking about algorithms for adaptive experimental design. Uh, and if you want to follow along, I've uploaded the slides at this link. So bro.io slash OED talk. Um, okay, so the outline of the talk will be as follows. First, I'll give a pretty broad introduction and motivation for why uh, we might want to do experimental design uh, with algorithms. And then I'll uh, proceed to sort of formalize those ideas uh, in using Bayesian methods. And then I'll give an extended example that tries to make some of those ideas uh, very concrete. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about how we can use variational methods to make some of these um, uh, formal ideas actually practical. And for the most part, I'm going to try avoiding being overly technical, although the fourth part of the talk will have a bit more technical meat to it. Um, in any case, feel free to interrupt uh, with questions if anything is unclear. So first of all, uh, what do I mean by an experimental design? So for the purposes of this talk, by design, I mean the part of the experiment that you control, right? So for example, if you're giving a patient, patient medicine, you control the dosage. If you're asking participants uh, questions in a survey, you control which questions and how many. Uh, if you're doing some imaging experiment, you might control the, the exposure time. And so schematically, you might think of this as a knob on your experiment that you get to set. Um, and the crucial world, word here, of course, is control. Um, so for example, you, of course, you choose which questions get asked in the survey, but the responses will be dictated by the participant, not by you, right? So that's something you don't control. So to sort of get at what I mean by an adaptive experimental procedure, let me try to uh, contrast that with this schematic for a traditional experimental procedure. So I'm generally going to assume that we're going to do uh, an multi-round experiment, let's say n rounds. Each of these blue boxes shows a, a single round. And there's a, importantly, there's a green box at the beginning where we design the experiment, right? So schematically, we're going to fix the knobs to the settings of interest. The experimentalist uses their intuition to choose them according to what they're, you know, what they know about the uh, system they're studying. We proceed to do all the experiments, we collect all the data, and then we analyze the data. So that's sort of a schematic for traditional experimental pipeline. An exciting thing that's happened in the last five or 10 years is that people have started using machine learning uh, at the very tail end of this pipeline to do data analysis. So that's cool and very uh, useful in certain cases. That also leads to an um, interesting question, which is maybe we should be sticking mach machine learning type methods into other parts of this pipeline. So uh, let me expand this pipeline to become an adaptive experimental pipeline. So we're still doing n rounds of experiments depicted in the blue boxes, and we're still designing the experiments depicted in the green boxes. But what's different now is that we're designing the experiment before each and every round. And in particular, when we design the experiment, uh, it will the choice that we make in the experimental design at that round will depend on the data that we aggregated in previous rounds, right? So we don't just aggregate the data once at the end, we're continuously looking at the data as we adjust the design adaptively through the experiment. Okay, so why would we wanna do something like this? Uh, so the sort of short answer is that experiments are expensive. We typically have some limited amount of experimental resources, a limited budget, limited time, limited number of grad students, limited number of patients and so on. So we wanna make the most out of those resources. And we hope that by you know, setting the knobs right, we'll um, have a better experiment. Um, and in particular, in some cases, human intuition, you know, experimentalists in general know their experiments very well. So their intuition goes quite far. But in some cases, it might just be too hard to rely on that intuition, right? If you have one or two or three knobs, you can maybe rely on your intuition. But if you have dozens or hundreds of knobs, then you might want a different kind of procedure for setting them. So let me first just give some uh, very ambitious examples as to places where you might want to do something like this. So one is that, you know, something that's become increasingly uh, common in different parts of biology are different kinds of combinatorial screens. And, you know, combinatorial numbers sort of almost by definition are very, very large. And so what, uh, so a combinatorial screen, if done exhaustively, is not only impractical, but it's actually impossible. The numbers are simply too large. So this is a case where you might hope that by adapt doing an adaptive experiment, you might be able to focus your resources towards uh, something interesting. Similarly, we've all heard uh, many times about how expensive clinical trials are. Maybe you, you only enroll a few hundred patients, right? So you really wanna make the most of those precious resources when designing an experiment in that setting. 
And finally, as a bonus, uh, if we formalize experimental design and we automate experimental design, then that automation can potentially enable uh, iterative experiments that have short turnaround times, right? So you can imagine, for example, a scenario, like let's say an imaging experiment where the experimentalist actually has really good intuition about how to set the knobs, but you want to do thousands of rounds of experiments and maybe you know there's only a few minutes uh, in between each round and so sure you could have the human in the loop setting the knobs but it would be better if you could just have a machine set up the knobs for you right so enabling these kind of uh, multi multi round iterative experiments is another uh, potentially interesting application area of these kinds of uh, methods so if OED, as I'm going to call it, optimal experimental design had a motto, it might read more informative experiments for the same time and money, or alternatively, equally informative experiments for less time and less money. So that's sort of our motto that we're going to try to shoot for. Okay, so I've sketched out uh, a beautiful dream for making and doing adaptive experiments. Now the important question, of course, is how can we actually realize this dream? Uh, so to, to try to motivate our plan of attack, I'm going to uh, share this somewhat silly thought experiment. So imagine that you're a genius scientist, perhaps in the tradition of uh, Dr. Frankenstein or Dr. Strangelove, and you, by virtue of having a gigantic brain and spending a lot of time in your attic, have discovered the theory of everything. And you're convinced that you deserve the Nobel Prize. And you know, however, that in order to get the Nobel Prize, you have to convince people that your theory is right. You know that it's right, but you need to do some experiments to convince people. And so you want to design an efficient experiment that quickly point, demonstrates how brilliant you are. OK, so how might you proceed in that setting? So a possible answer is the following. Since you have this very detailed theory of everything that sort of describes all the dynamics of everything that's happening, you can write down a very accurate computer simulator. And then you can simulate a bunch of artificial experiments with different experimental designs using your detailed simulator. And then you can simply just pick the design that uh, is most effective in proving that your theory is correct. So you're gonna, you might object to that and say, but I actually don't know the theory of everything. So how could I possibly you know, follow this strategy? And this, one of the sort of core ideas of uh, this OED setup is that even though, you don't, even though you don't know the theory of everything, you can still follow that basic recipe. The only difference is that um, you're going to replace step one with writing down a probabilistic model. So you don't need necessarily a theory of everything. You just need a reasonably good model. So let me make that a little bit more concrete. What kind of model do I mean? Right. So in the system that you're studying, you know, there might be parts of the dynamics that you understand really well. Maybe you have a specific mechanistic model that you have of parts of the, the dy dynamics. If so, you can stick that into your model. Maybe there are certain parameters that uh, describe your system that you've measured very well in previous experiments. So you can stick those into your model. Maybe there are other parameters, though, that you're much less certain about, but maybe you have some vague idea of what they could be. So you can put some prior distributions on those parameters. Uh, and finally, maybe the other parts of the dynamics that you don't know very much about, but there you can at least make some distributional assumptions about what you think is uh, reasonable. So that's what I mean by a probabilistic model. And in, uh, an important caveat here is, you know, there, um, as in most places in life, there's no free lunch here, right? So the way we're gonna, the, in order for this kind of optimal experimental design procedure to make sense, we need to write down a model that at least captures some of the important characteristics of our actual data generative process that's, you know, that describes our actual experiment, right? So if you were to totally misspecify this model, that's gonna to lead to trouble. You don't need a perfect model, right? The whole point of using probabilistic models that can incorporate uncertainty and um, so on. So it doesn't need to be perfect, but if, if you have absolutely no idea how to write down a probabilistic model for the system under the study, then uh, no dice, unfortunately. Okay, so if we're gonna write down a probabilistic model, we need to quickly review Bayesian modeling and uh, the notation that I'll be using for the rest of this talk. So again, I'm gonna assume that we're doing N rounds of experiments and in each experiment, we make some observation, which I'm gonna denote as X. And collectively, I'll denote uh, several observations by this script D. Secondly, there's a parameter of interest. This is a random variable that we don't know about, but that we're trying to measure and learn about by doing our experiments. So that will be theta. And then finally, there's a likelihood which connects theta to the observations x. And also uh, when I want uh, to 
denote the product of all the likelihoods over all the data, I'll also use this notation P of script D given theta. So those are the main components of a Bayesian model. The one thing that's missing is the prior, which is a distribution on theta, which encodes our prior understanding of what our likely values of theta might be. And then finally, just uh, an important quantity, of course, in Bayesian inference and modeling is this posterior distribution, which is effectively the distribution that you get when you multiply the likelihood with the prior and normalize. So this distribution effectively encodes everything you know about theta after you've done the experiment and, and observed the observation script D. So it's sort of a compromise between the information in the prior and the information that you've learned by describing the observed data. So that's a lightning review of Bayesian modeling in our notation. Uh, now the question becomes, where does the design go, right? So we've talked about theta, we've talked about X, but where does the design go, right? So the design of course has to enter into the likelihood. It wouldn't make sense for the design to go into the prior, right? The prior encodes thing we know about the world. The design is something that we're gonna do in a subsequent experiment, right? So it wouldn't make sense for the design to go to the prior. The design will need to go into the likelihood. So we're gonna end up with a design dependent likelihood like this, P of X given theta and D. So to make that a bit more concrete, here's a simple example. Imagine we're doing some sort of uh, chemistry experiment. And the thing that we control in our lab, our design D is a temperature. So this is one of our knobs that we get a set on our Bunsen burner. The thing that we're uh, studying, theta, the thing that we're trying to learn about and infer is let's say some set of kinetic parameters for the uh, chemical compounds of interest. And finally, the thing that we're measuring are let's say some molecular counts. Um, and all of this can then be encapsulated in a distribution like this, P of X given theta and D. The reason this is a distribution, you know, was gonna vary from situation to situation, right? Maybe our uh, uh, observation, maybe our observations are inherently stochastic because of the way we're measuring X. Maybe the underlying dynamics are inherently stochastic. Maybe there's, uh, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, different scenarios. And this likelihood, depending on the scenario, might be really simple, it might be really complex, right? You can imagine like sticking an ordinary differential equation into this likelihood. Maybe the likelihood is actually very simple. There's a whole world of possibilities that uh, can be encoded by this formalization. Okay, so now that we've started to formalize how designs enter into our modeling setup, we can ask uh, an important question, which is what makes a good experiment? So the intuition here is that a good experiment is an informative experiment. And so to make that uh, clear, let's consider a, a, an experiment that we're gonna conduct with two different designs. So we're gonna conduct one experiment with design D1, and then we'll conduct a second experiment with design D2. Before we've done the experiment, we have a prior distribution over theta, and that's shown here. And after we have done the experiment, we're gonna collect observations and we'll compute the posterior that incorporates the observations that we've made at, after each of our two experiments. And what we can see here is that on the left, the posterior after the experiment with design D1 is essentially identical to the prior that we started out with, whereas the posterior after the experiment with design D2 has become very narrow, right? Which means that our uncertainty about theta has decreased, and that means we've learned a lot from the second experiment. Whereas from the first experiment, we've learned very little. So one way you can formalize this is to say that the entropy of the posterior distribution on the left is high and the posterior entropy on the right is low, right? So we want experiments that drive us towards the regime where posterior entropy gets lower and lower and lower because that means that we're learning a lot about theta. So that's the intuition that we have. And to make that uh, even more concrete, we're going to introduce a quantity called the information gain. So suppose we do an experiment with design D and observe the data point X. So we're gonna define the information gain as the difference between the prior entropy and the posterior entropy, right? So recall that the entropy, I've given the definition of the entropy here at the bottom. It's just a, um, it's something that's measured in let's say bits or nats that measures how much uncertainty there is in a distribution. And the information gain will be the difference between the prior and the posterior entropy. And because the posterior depends on the observation X, this posterior entropy does, um, um, depends on X. And so the information gain also de depends on X. And uh, by construction, this is always a non-negative number, right? So even in a poor experiment, we always learn something, but you know, we potentially learn very little. And we want experiments that we learn a lot from. <laughs> 
There's one uh, problem with this criterion, which is that it depends explicitly on X, right? So we'd wanna use this criterion to help us choose an experiment, but X is thing that we only observe after we've done the experiment, right? So we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem here where we'd like to use this criterion to help us choose an experiment, but it depends on an observational outcome that we haven't observed yet. So in order to make this a practical criterion, we have to get rid of X somehow. And so to do that, I'm gonna define the expected information gain. Effectively, we need to integrate out X and we're gonna integrate out X using the only distribution lying around that is a you know, reasonable distribution in X space, which is um, the marginal distribution that we get uh, given our prior, right? So that distribution is shown here at the bottom. Conceptually, you can think of, you know, to draw a sample from this distribution, what you do is you draw a sample theta from your prior. So this is sort of like imagining a possible universe you might live in. And then conditioned on theta and also conditionally conditioned on D, the design that you're gonna be doing in the experiment, you, um, you sample an observation X. And so this expected information gain integrates out all possible values of X according to everything that we know about the world right now as encapsulated in our prior, right? So this is really the mathematical realization of this idea that I shared earlier that we're gonna just simulate a bunch of experiments. This is, our, this is how we sort of simulate forward and imagine different universes and do different experiments in those different universes. And for each such imagined experiment that we do, we're gonna uh, compute the information gain, we're gonna aggregate or average all those information gains, and that will give us our final criterion of interest, this expected information gain, which crucially depends on the design D because our likelihood uh, depends on our design D, right? So this is a criterion that we can use now to uh, ask ourselves the question, do we expect this experiment to be informative or not? Uh, and it's important at this point to point out that this quantity, uh, while very natural, is not easy to compute in general. And so there are different ways you can write down uh, this quantity, right? I initially introduced this expected information gain as being related to a difference in entropies. So you can massage that formula in various different ways, just using algebra and Bayes rule. And I've shown what, one such formulation of the, the formula here on the left. So in particular, we have an expectation and the expectations with respect to the joint density over X and theta. And the integrand of this exp expectation explicitly contains the posterior P of theta given X and D. And so if you know anything about Bayesian inference, you know that it's typically intractable to compute the posterior even for a single value of X. Whereas here we're being asked to compute the posterior for many, many different values of X because we're in fact integrating X out through the expectation uh, that uh, with respect to this model, right? So this, this quantity is in some sense doubly intractable, intractable because it contains a posterior uh, in the inner loop and in the outer loop, we have this sort of intractable, potentially intractable expectation, right? So this quantity in general is gonna be very hard to compute. Uh, so that might give us some pause but uh, we'll worry about that later. So first let's just continue our formalization. So now that we have this EIG criterion, the expected information gain, we can now define the optimal design. So the optimal design will simply be the design D that maximizes this quantity EIG. And you know, we, we a priori, you know, before we do the experiment, we, we have some admissible set of designs, right? So for example, maybe the, the allowable temperatures on our Bunsen burner are between 30 and 100 degrees Celsius, say. So we're gonna maximize over whatever set of designs we're willing to maximize over. And that will then define our optimal design. And given our theoretical approach, <clears throat> and given, you know, if we have any sort of faith in our model, we expect that doing an experiment with this design will be very informative, right? So this, this slide effectively com completes our formalization. This is how we're going to use Bayesian methods and sort of information theoretic ideas to um, formalize what we mean by choosing a good design. So this is probably a good place for me to pause and uh, see if there are any questions about this formalization before I go on. Um, I, I have actually two questions, uh, Luca here. So one question is about uh, the statement that you made that uh, the design should not enter into the prior, the, 
but in your example that you used, for example, of the temperature and the chemical reaction, uh, I would expect that your knowledge of the kinetic parameters will actually depend on the temperature. So given the temperature is your knob and your prior is the kinetic parameters for that equation, and I would expect that, you know, it would be reasonable to say, I expect the kinetic parameter to depend on temperature in a certain way. And so, yeah, I mean, that's sort of maybe a weird case, but I think you can always probably formalize it in a way that you separate the prior from the, like if you, I think you could probably re-parameterize your model in such a way that that separation holds. I mean, we'd have to think about that case. In I mean, if you, if you imagine, if you just imagine that the, the equations for the chemical reaction involve both temperature and some other parameters, then as long as you separate them in that way, then you could say, I'm trying to measure the other parameters, the ones that are independent of the temperature. Okay, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, maybe I'll keep the second one for the discussion at 12. Thank you. All right, so let me go one more go on. Yeah. Alex, um, so if you had a stage-wise design like you had in one of your uh, kind of uh, earlier flow charts, um, if you're doing this once at each stage, it's kind of a, a greedy algorithm almost. Um, but if you knew that you were going to get to do this multiple times, maybe your ultimate strategy would be different. I don't know if that, does that make sense? Yeah, so I mean, the strategy I've implicitly described is this sort of one step strategy, this greedy strategy. Um, but you know, as I pointed out, like computing this EIG is very difficult. So even just trying to do this one step ahead is going to be hard. So if, sure. if, you, knew, if you knew that you're going to do 100 experiments, then you could, in theory, choose 100 designs in one co and simulate 100 rounds of experiments jointly. And that would, in theory, you know, be more optimal or be, you know, at least if you trust your model. But that it, computationally is going to be so challenging that uh, it, let's just start with doing, doing things one, okay. <laughs> one round at a time. And more simply, if you were going to, say, do the chemistry experiment at two different temperatures, then you could actually have an ordered pair of temperatures in your, or sorry, a pair of temperatures in your design, and that be the space, right? So you could also think of sure. parameterizing things yeah. that way. Yeah. In fact, if you want to do batch experiments in the sense that you're doing multiple rounds uh, kind of simultaneously, yeah. then one way to formalize that is to sort of just make your design space a cross product yeah. design space. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so now I'm, oh, I'm so going to give. Nick. Oh, okay. If you're moving on, I will keep it for the discussion. I have a quick question about. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, so now I'm going to give an extended example that's hopefully going to make some of these formal ideas a bit more concrete. Um, so we're going to design an experiment to test a participant's memory capacity. And this is a very simple experiment, but it's actually based on a classical experiment done many decades ago in the psychology literature. So. In each round, we're gonna ask the participant to memorize a D digit number. So D is gonna be our design here. We're gonna, you know, our, we choose whether to ask the participant to ask to memorize a three digit number or a four digit number or a seven digit number and so on. And after we generate a random number with D digits, we show the number to the participant, we're gonna cover it up and then they will be asked to regurgitate that number. And then they will either get it right or wrong, right? So the outcome here is whether or not they correctly remember the number. And that is the kind of, that's the totality of our simple little experiment. And we're gonna do multiple rounds. So to formalize this and to use these OED methods, we of course need to write down an appropriate probabilistic model. And so to do that, um, first let's look at the likelihood that I've shown here at the bottom, right? Recall that the outcome X is binary. So we need just a Bernoulli um, distribution of some kind. And what I have here is basically a simple generalized linear model where the logit that controls the probability of the Bernoulli depends explicitly on our parameter of interest theta, which I'm going to call the memory capacity, which is just some real valued number. And this logit uh, gets larger as theta increases, right? So the larger your memory capacity is, the more likely you are to um, be able to correctly memorize a, a given number. And importantly also, this logit becomes increasingly negative as D increases, right? So th this just encodes our intuition that 
even, even if someone has a large memory capacity, as D gets sufficiently large, they will event, uh, the person will have, find it harder and harder to correctly memorize the number, right? So this is a very simple model. It only has a single parameter, but this is enough of a, you know, there's enough complexity here for us to sort of um, look at the main concepts of OED. So let's continue with this uh, modeling setup. So we can actually compute this expected information gain very easily for this simple model. And so I've done that here. So on the horizontal axis, we have the design D, the number of digits. And on the vertical axis, I have this expected information gain computed, or it's basically in bits, right? So we can think of this as information. And what you see is that we get this very nice bell-shaped curve. And it turns out that the optimal design uh, for the prior that I chose, I, uh, the prior I chose here had a mean of seven and a variance of uh, square root of four or two. And so that sort of is um, an important, you know, that that's why we ended up getting a fact, uh, seven for the optimal design here. But in any case, the important thing, uh, you know, what's important to point out here is that, you know, it's very easy to understand intuitively what's going on here, right? So imagine that I asked the participant to memorize a two digit number. So given our prior expectations about the participant and through, as governed by our prior, we know that it's very unlikely that they will incorrectly, um, um, you know, the, the, the question will be very easy for them. They'll almost certainly get the number uh, correctly. They'll remember it correctly. And so as a consequence, in asking that question, we're learning very little about the participant. Conversely, if we ask them to memorize a thousand digit number, they will almost certainly get it wrong. And so we'll again have learned very little about them. There's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle where we ask them a question that's sort of hard, but not too hard, where there's a reasonably good chance they'll get it right, but there's also a reasonably good chance they'll get it wrong. It's that sweet spot or Goldie's, Goldilocks spot that will give us the optimal design. Now, this is a very simple experiment. So, you know, it, it, might, it might seem kind of obvious that you don't want to ask a you know, you're not going to waste your your experimental budget on asking the person to memorize thousand digit numbers, right? So you don't need this formalism to tell you that. But in a much more complex uh, experimental setup, you know, having a good heuristic or having your intuition guide you towards an optimal design is going to be much more difficult. And so it's, it's you know, it's, it's for these more complex experimental setups that we really want this kind of formalization. Okay, so I'm now going to go through a three-round experiment of this adapted of this um, of, mem of this memorization or uh, memory capacity experiment. And so, in each round, remember we're going, to, we're going to go through three different steps. First, we'll go we'll have the design phase where we compute the expected information gain given the current prior. We'll choose the optimal design, and then we'll conduct an experiment according to that design. We'll record the observation. We'll update the prior to the new posterior given the recorded observation, and then we'll proceed to the next round of the experiment. So let's just go through uh, three rounds here. So first you can see here, I've computed graphically the experimental or the EIG and the maximum is at seven. So we're going to uh, choose seven for this current experiment because that's our optimal design. We're gonna write down a random seven digit number. We're gonna proceed to cover it up the participant now makes their guess. The participant gets it wrong. Okay, so we record that observation. We compute a new posterior over theta and notice that it shifted to the left because the person got it wrong. So we have less faith in their memory. Now we're gonna compute the new EIG given the observations we have. The optimal experimental design is six. So we write down a six digit uh, number. The part we cover it up. The participant again makes their guess. And this time the participant again got it wrong. So we re record that observation and we compute our new posterior which is computed further to the left because we have even less faith in this person's memory. We recompute the EIG. Now the optimal design is five. Now we're gonna write down a five digit number. Now that we cover it up, the participant makes their guess. And because we've made things easier for them, they finally get it right. We update our, our posterior and you can see here that, you know, as we've adaptively chosen the design to be sort of appropriately difficult for the participant, we sort of end up with a, you know, our posterior keeps getting narrower and narrower as we proceed from round to round. So that's sort of what we want um, to happen ideally in an adaptive experiment. 
And so here you can see a figure that is a, the same as the figure in the previous slide, except now I've done 10 rounds of experiments, right? So you can see that we started out with a very broad prior, but after 10 rounds, the posterior keeps sharpening and sharpening as we collected more data about the participant. And we're finally zooming in on their uh, memory capacity. So um, here's another figure that gets at something similar. So what I've done here is I've done 10 experiments again. And what I'm plotting is the final posterior distribution after 10 rounds of experiments. But I've done uh, two different experiment. I've done two different experimental runs, each one with 10 runs, but using two different ways of choosing the design. So the orange curve shows the uh, final posterior distribution I get if I've done if I've chosen the design at each step using this optimal design setup. Whereas the blue curve shows the final posterior that I get if I instead use some heuristic design. And so this is a very simple example, but what you can see is that uh, when we chose the optimal design, the final posterior distribution is actually narrower than the final posterior distribution that we get if we use the heuristic design, simply because the heuristic design is asking stupid questions. You know, it's asking the, 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 the person to memorize, for example, two digit numbers and so on and so forth. And those questions just aren't very informative from the point of view of this um, modeling setup, right? So uh, this is a very simple scenario, but even in this simple scenario, uh, we see that choosing an optimal design can make our experiment more efficient. So this sort of gets back to the OED motto that I raised earlier, which would, in this case would read equally informative experiment for less time and money. Okay, so, that's a very simple experiment, a very simple model. The question is, can we make OED practical on larger and more complex uh, models? And so do, to do that, right, uh, there are basically two important components. One of them is EIG estimation, right? How do we actually estimate this expected information gain as a function of design? And then the second part is the optimization part, right? Even if we can know how to compute the expected information gain exactly, we still need to optimize that with respect to design, which introduces an optimization problem. So both, both, both of these components are in, uh, potentially difficult. Uh, and I'm gonna just focus for the remainder of this talk on this first component, noting that the second component is also you know, worth discussion and is potentially a problem. Okay, so in order to do that, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna use variational methods to try to make, to try to estimate EIG. So let me quickly review variational methods. So variational methods just very generally are when you take some problem and you cast it as an optimization problem. So this is used all over different parts of math and science, right? So for example, quantum physicists and quantum chemists turn eigenvalue problems into variational problems and have a lot of success with that. Uh, Bayesians also use variational methods. And uh, in particular, Bayesians use variational methods to approximate the posterior distribution. So here at the top, I've given the sort of textbook definition of a posterior, which is that the posterior is given the, as this particular integral, uh, but there's an equally valid and equally good way that we can uh, represent the posterior as an optimization problem. And that is shown here at the bottom. So what we, what we have here is we have some distribution Q of theta and Q of theta is some normalized distribution. And we're gonna compute a quantity called the elbow, which is the expected lower bound, which is just this expectation of this integrand with respect to Q. This integrand depends on the model. It in fact contains the same model joint density that appears directly in the posterior definition, but it also depends on Q here. And it turns out that if you maximize this elbow, which is again, a, function, a functional of Q over all possible distributions, that you, in fact, up to some regularity conditions, recover the posterior exactly, right? So the definition at the top is actually equivalent to the definition of the bottom, and textbooks may prefer the definition of the top, but the one at the bottom is equally good. And the interesting thing about this definition is that it quickly opens the door to some approximations, right? So the equality that I showed on the previous slide only holds if we maximize over the space of all distributions. So that of course is in general a very hard thing to do, but something that we might try to do instead is reduce our family Q to some finite, some finite family of um, distributions parametrized by some finite um, parameter, let's say phi, and we can still compute this elbow quantity and we can still try to ma maximize this elbow quantity by choosing the member of script Q 
that um, it, you know achieves the maximum attainable. And it turns out that if we do that, then we, you know, we're not going to in general recover the true posterior, but we'll still get a potentially pretty good approximation in a very uh, well-defined sense. And another important thing to point out is that, uh, in fact, if we if we find such a cue that delivers a, a high value of the elbow, not only is it a good posterior approximation, but it turns out that this elbow is in fact a lower bound to uh, the log evidence, which is this log marginal um, quantity uh, depicted here at the bottom left. So this is actually a useful. Um, this is a, in fact in how you might you know coming up with one of these lower or upper bounds is it in fact a good way to try to derive this sort of setup, right? So if we want to apply variational methods to EIG estimation, this suggests that what we should do is write down an appropriate lower upper bound of the EIG. So that's the question that we ask ourselves if we want to use these methods in the context of uh, OED. And it turns out that there are in fact many uh, upper and lower bounds that you can write down to the EIG. And I'm only gonna discuss one of them, uh, arguably the simplest one. And so here on the left, I've again uh, written down the definition of the EIG, which again, remember is an expectation with respect to the joint density of the model over X and theta. And then there's this integrand, which explicitly depends on the posterior distribution. So on the right-hand side, I've replaced that um, that uh, definition with a different uh, expression. And the expression is very similar. The expectation is still with respect to this joint density, but I've replaced the uh, posterior distribution at the top with a free form variational distribution, Q given Q of theta given X and D, right? So it turns out that if I stick in any normalized distribution Q and compute the object on the right, that is always a lower bound to the EIG. And in particular, uh, if I choose a Q that makes this quantity very large, uh, as large as possible, such that this bound becomes um, you know, somewhat tight, then I can use that as an approximation of the EIG. So that's the sort of uh, computational strategy that we'll be following. And a bonus of this procedure is that if you do find a Q that does a good job of maximizing the right-hand side, that Q is also uh, necessarily a good approximation of the posterior, unsurprisingly. So you might notice actually that this expression on the right-hand side looks a lot like the elbow that I wrote down earlier. One of the main differences though, is that the expectation here is with respect to the model, P of X and theta, this joint density, and it's not with respect to Q. If we go back to the elbow, you can see that this expectation was with respect to Q. This expectation now is with respect to the model, right? So there's a, you know, it's similar, but different to the elbow. Okay, so now we have this lower bound to the EIG and it turns out, and we can maximize this using stochastic gradient methods like those that are familiar from variational inference in general or from variational autocoders. So I don't wanna go into this in too much detail, but if there's one thing that machine learning people have gotten good at in the last five or 10 years, it's solving stochastic optimization problems. Uh, in part because the algorithms have gotten better, but also the software has gotten better, right? So one of the key components in doing something like this in practice is, is having to compute gradients. And if you have automatic differentiation software, that of course makes things a lot easier. And that software th thankfully has gotten a lot better. So the, without going too much into the details, you know, the basic idea is that, you know, we can't compute this right-hand side uh, in closed form in most cases. But what we often can do is compute a Monte Carlo estimate, right? So we just draw samples X and theta and compute the integrand. And then we can differentiate that Monte Carlo sample with respect to the parameters of our distribution Q. That generates a noisy stochastic estimate of the gradient. And we can use those stochastic gradients to solve our optimization problem. So that's the sort of flavor of how this EIG estimation is gonna go. We introduce a family of distributions Q we compute stochastic gradients, we try to maximize this quantity, and finally we'll end up with a uh, approximation of the EIG. Okay, so that now that we have all those pieces, we can sort of start putting them together. So here on this slide, I've shown what the co complete OED pipeline will look around for a simple, uh, for a single round of experiments. So again, we're gonna use these variational methods to um, approximate the EIG. And then we're gonna maximize the EIG with respect to the design. And then finally, we're gonna run an experiment according to the chosen design. So this is really the sort of formalization of the cartoon uh, picture I showed at the beginning of the 
um, presentation that the uh, Dr. Frankenstein and Dr. Strangelove would follow with their theory of everything. And that's what one round looks like. What do many rounds look like? Well, if we squint, it looks very similar, right? So we're gonna do many rounds. In each round, we're gonna follow three steps. In the first round, we in the first part you know, of each round, we approximate the IG, then we maximize the IG, and then finally we run the experiment according to the chosen design. The sort of wrinkle or the complication that's important here is that as we do more and more experiments, in each round, we're collecting new observations. And that means that we're learning more and more about theta. And so our prior distribution over theta actually gets updated from round to round, right? So in the first round, our prior is whatever our specified prior is, but in subsequent rounds, the prior is actually the posterior that we get uh, that incorporates the most recently observed observations, right? So the sort of mantra might be last round's posterior is this round's prior, right? So the formalism goes through exactly as before, we just have to make sure to update the prior distribution that enters into our EIG and use the appropriate prior distribution that incorporates all the observed data seen thus far. And uh, luckily, like I said, um, when, when we find a good Q that maximizes, that we use to maximize and approximate the EIG, that Q distribution is also a good um, approximation of the posterior. So we can actually just reuse that Q as our prior in the current round. So we don't have to do additional computations as the computations have already been done in order to approximate the EIG. Okay, so that basically just wraps up the, um, the sort of framework for OED that I'm interested in and that I wanted to describe. But before I wrap up, I wanted to describe one or two last technical points that are important because they go a far way in um, explaining why and how these variational methods can actually be made quite efficient in practice. And the idea here is that of amortization. So th this might be familiar to you from, uh, for example, the variational autoencoder. So in the variational autoencoder, there's a so-called um, encoder network or sometimes also called an inference network. So the sort of amortization is basically the same idea that's used in such an encoder network. So let's see how this amortization idea um, works in this particular context. So let's suppose for a second that our parameter theta is real valued. Let's say it's just the scalar. And so and a, fa a family of distributions uh, that we could use for Q would just be a normal distribution. And a normal distribution is fully specified by a mean mu and a square root variance sigma. And you can imagine, remember that when we compute the EIG, we have to do so for many values of X, or sorry, we have to compute, so we have to compute the EIG for many values of D, and we need an approximate posterior from, with respect to many different values of X. And so one way you could uh, do that is just by having separate values of mu and sigma for different values of x and d, uh, but that wouldn't be very satisfying. So what we can do instead is introduce a neural network that ingests x and d and spits out appropriate values of mu and sigma. And the reason this sort of approach makes sense is because amortization effectively allows us to share statistical strength between different observations X, right? So again, here I've written down this definition of the EIG. And as you can see, it is an expectation with respect to the joint density over P. And so you can imagine if I were to compute this quantity using let's say a naive Monte Carlo estimate, I would, one of the first things I would do is sample a bunch of X's so I can approximate this expectation. And then for each value of X, I would compute an approximate posterior. And if I did so naively, I would just compute those each of those posteriors uh, separately and individually. But if I do that, I'm leaving on the table the opportunity for some uh, shared computation. So in particular, on the bottom here, I've, I've shown four different values of X and four different um, posteriors that result. And if we use a neural network, instead of having to learn all those posteriors separately, the neural network can just spit out appropriate values of mu and sigma for each of those approximate distributions. And that will allow us to effectively share statistical strength in X space and also potentially in design space, right? So sort of schematically, you can imagine that if I have computed an approximate posterior for a given value of 
x, let's say x1, and I've also computed an approximate value for a different value of x, let's say x2, if I look at some third value of x that is somehow in between x1 and x2, I can in some way interpolate those two approximate posteriors to come up with an appropriate third approximate posterior. And the neural network machinery is effectively doing that, right? It's basically interpolating between different x's and it allows us to share statistical strength. And so this goes a long way to explaining why these uh, variational methods can in fact be very efficient it's first of all, you know, there are basically two components to what we did that are of particular importance. One, we changed EIG estimation into an optimization problem, and we're really good at optimization problems. And secondly, we can use this amortization mechanism to, uh, you know, share statistical strength, and those two components together result in efficient EIG estimation. Okay, so let me quickly summarize. I've tried to uh, convince you that Bayesian OED is a principled paradigm for designing data-driven iterative experiments. And I've also tried to show how variational methods can uh, help make this approach practical and efficient. Uh, and there are of course, like in any methodology, some remaining challenges. So let me quickly discuss some of those. Uh, one of those is that estimating the EIG can still be expensive or hard in some cases, right? So for example, if the, des if the design D is very high dimensional, or if the parameter of interest theta is very high dimensional, then estimating the AIG uh, is potentially gonna be difficult. Uh, secondly, you know, I really only talked about the EIG estimation part of this. There's also, again, this design optimization bit. And depending on the details, that also might be difficult, right? So you can imagine if the design is finite dimensional and you know, let's say there are only 10 different designs that we're looking at, then we can just exhaustively enumerate all 10 designs, compute the EIG for each design, and then the optimization problem is trivial. But if the design is high dimensional, and let's say it's discrete, then you know, it's impractical to exhaustively compute the EIG for all those, all those designs. So there you're gonna to have to do something more clever. So all that to say that design optimization might be challenging in some scenarios. And then finally, I'd like to just re repeat my caveat, which is that all of this is sort of hinges on the fact that you write down a model, which is at least somewhat reasonable and reflects at least the important uh, dynamics in your experimental system. So if you, if you um, horribly misspecify your model, then that could potentially lead to suboptimal experiments. Um, an, op an interesting research question that I'm interested in is whether we can make this EIG estimation more efficient still, right? So even though using variational methods has gone a long way in making this more efficient, recall that I'm still learning one of these two distributions in between each round, right? So I still have to do some amount of um, optimization in between rounds. And there's a question whether we might be able to uh, uh, do more work up front, do more amortization so that things are a bit faster. And one potential angle of attack would be to try to exploit additional structure in the model, right? So one of the strengths of the variational methods that I described is that they're very generic, right? They don't really use the particular model structure in any particular way. But that is also, uh, that leaves the door open to maybe methods which exploit that structure more explicitly. So I think the, that there's an opportunity to develop such methods. It'll be interesting to see if that uh, direction actually is fruitful in practice. So uh, I'd like to just end by saying that I'm broadly very excited about experimental design. So if you're in the broad community or really if you're anyone anywhere and you have an interesting experimental design problem, please reach out to me because I'd love to talk about it. You know, the methodology that, the, that I described here may not be best suited to your problem, but there may be other methodologies that are. Uh, it's also worth pointing out here that I think that the sort of OED problems that are probably, um, you know, the biggest uh, opportunity for impact using this kind of methodology are probably scenarios where you have many, many rounds of experiments, right? Perhaps dozens or thousands of rounds of experiments. And also, I think an area of particular interest are experiments that where the turnaround time is pretty short, right? Because if the turnaround time is short, you can do many rounds, and there's often a there's really a need for automation automation because it's just impractical for a human in the loop to design thousands of rounds of experiments uh, when the turnaround time is short. I'd also like to thank my collaborators who have worked on OED projects with me. In particular, I'd like to thank Adam Foster, who did a lot of the heavy lifting on uh, the two papers that we wrote on this topic, 
and also, among many other things, made the animation that I shared in the middle of the presentation. Uh, and then finally, let me just lead you, leave you with some references. So this Bayesian optimal experimental design idea is an old one. It's been around for decades. At the top here is an old review that uh, is worth looking at if you want to see some references. I've also listed the two uh, papers that we wrote about using variational methods uh, in this context. And then finally, like Alex mentioned at the very beginning, I also work on the pyro probabilistic programming language. And you know, one of the cool things about probabilistic programming languages is that the, um, they allow you to build sort of general purpose inference machine machinery that is model agnostic, right? So the user can write down the model and the framework worries about inference. And it turns out that you can do something similar with some of this OED machinery and write it down in a model agnostic way. And so we've done some of that. So the idea is that if you can write down your probabilistic model as a probabilistic program, then you can leverage some of this OED machinery uh, in, on your experiment. And so in particular, there's a blog post that we wrote that uh, gives a bit of an introduction into that. And finally, there are also two pyro tutorials that give two specific examples with code. So if you're interested in that, please take a look.